Are you ready for Christmas? Kind of. I want you to put your hand up if you're on the naughty list this year. Anyone's on the naughty list? And put your hand up if you think you're on the good list. So, yes, it's all about gifts at Christmas. You know, I kind of heard this story about a young boy who desperately wanted a new bike for Christmas. And so he asked his parents for a bike, and his parents, good parents, wanted to teach him the important lessons of prayer. Anybody have those type of parents? I think it's a great lesson to teach your children about prayer. And so they said to him, why don't you go and write Jesus a letter and as a prayer asking him for what you want for Christmas? Thanks, Mum and Dad. So not pleased with the response to his parents, Johnny, he immediately throws a little bit of a tenter tantrum. He goes upstairs, he gets some paper out, he takes his pen and he goes, Dear Jesus, I have been a good boy this year and would like a new bicycle. Can you see if I can have a new bicycle? Your friend, Johnny. Now, Johnny then thought, oh, Jesus probably really knows what sort of year I actually have had. Not wanting to lie to Jesus, he throws his pen across the room. (laughs) In a temper tantrum, retrieves said pen, dear Jesus, I have been an okay boy this year and I want a new bicycle, yours truly, Johnny. Dear Jesus, I thought about being an okay, honest boy this year. Can I have a bicycle? Hmm. So Donny looks deep into his heart and he understands that his parents perhaps really were teaching him a lesson. He sneaks downstairs and there he sees the nativity. So he quickly takes Mary from the nativity. He gently walks her upstairs to his bedroom, wraps her in this lovely blanket, hides it under his duvet, and then he writes, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, get me a bicycle. That's not a true story, nor is it from my life, just in case you were wondering on that. I kind of, I do love Christmas. Uh, I know it is different this year for, for many, many reasons. And every one of us is trying to grab some form of normality and yet everything seems to have changed. And yet I think if I can bring your attention back to God, actually not a lot has changed because there's a great verse in the Bible that says Jesus of God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's an unchanging God. And it's one of my rock solid foundation points that whatever happens when I am watching the news, whatever happens in my year, good or bad, you know, you know, well or not, God remains the same. And there is an underlying message here of Christmas I want you to grab hold of because I think what God wants to speak into is because when we hear the words of God that are eternal into our life, they form a foundation for us to build on. And the Bible says we will never be shaken. There's a lot of things being shaken right now. There's a lot of people shaking next to us. But you know, when you know God, you know his divine and eternal purposes, you can remain solid in the storm. And that's an incredible thing that you can learn as you grow as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I I wanna talk on creating Christmas because I've noticed in life that at Christmas, we start creating or making things. Who likes to make things food uh, at Christmas? What's your favorite recipe? What sort of things? Shout out, and uh, if you're at home, you can type in on the text, what things do you make at Christmas? Come on, shout them out so I can hear. Hot chocolate, nice, isn't it? You're gonna have hot chocolate after this service, by the way, with shortbread biscuits. Anything else? What? Christmas cake. Who loves Christmas cake? It's going to be a Marmite question, isn't it? Uh, Just as an advice, Christmas cake and a bit of cheese. I know that's a bit of a northern thing, but try it and then come back after Christmas. You know, don't prove me. Don't say it until you've tried it. You know, that's the whole thing of that. Uh, Anything else that people cook? Mince pies, isn't it? I've noticed, by the way, um, we have different um, students that come and spend the year of us. And and we've got two from Germany, uh, which was funny. For the first time they eat, have you had a mince pie? 
They just cannot get mincemeat, you know, in a mince pie. It's a, the strangest thing in the world for if you're not British. Actually, in fairness, we can't get it either. We just eat them at Christmas, isn't it? You don't have to like it to eat it. That's the kind of thing at Christmas. Anything else? Sausage rolls. Nice, hot, fresh sausage rolls. Anybody do cookies, Christmas cookies? Yeah, so we just like creating things and making things. What's that? Pigs in blankets. You actually make pigs in blankets. That is an effort. That is good. But we also make decorations. Put your hand up if you've made a Christmas decoration this year. Anybody made baubles? Wave at me frantically. Kind of you do with the kids. Anybody made a wreath? You know, we get, we get quite creative. Anybody make Christmas cards? Now, somebody has made me a Christmas card today, which I'm going to use today. But there are so many creative things. And I kind of just wanted to pause. Why do we make or create things around Christmas time? Because we find in doing that, it brings us together. If you've ever had children, out comes a good old faithful prit stick and, you know, we cut things out and we get all creative and we all sit around the table, you know, and, and we get the kind of um, scissors and sellotape and we, and we start making things. And here's the thing, it's not about what we're making often, it's about the experience of making together that something rises up. Have you noticed when you make things, you make things for other people? I don't know if you've joined the two, but there's this incredible creative side to us that we're able to create and make things, and then we do it together, and then we make something so that we can go and give something. Go, here is something I've made. Who remembers when their children were really tiny, bringing home their picture from school and going, I've made you, and it goes in the peak of it, on the fridge, you know, of this work of art. You know, we're designed to create, we're designed to create together, and we're designed to create together to give to others for other people's happiness. Have you ever worked that line out? Where does that come from? Why are we like that? Well, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that says, we are made in the image of God. What that means is, you are made as a reflection of the goodness and the greatness of God. So all of this creative stuff that comes out of you is because God is creative. Because he wanted you to be creative too, because God created the world. In the planet in which we sent, he created, I don't know if you know, but God created you. The Bible says you are a masterpiece. Just turn to somebody on your right and left and say, I'm a masterpiece. Now turn the other side and say, I am God's gift. Right? That, that is not a lie. We, we say that sounds arrogant and proudful, but actually you are a gift of God that he made you with a special purpose. He designed you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made and God looks at you and goes, wow, that is incredible. Because God, being made in me God, he makes things, he makes things together and he makes us for each other that actually he gives us one to another so that we can help each other. And I want us to understand what God is doing because God never does anything by accident. We are designed to create. We're designed to create together. And so I want to encourage you as you start this Christmas week that you ask yourself, what am I making over Christmas? Am I making a mess of my life or am I making memories? And memories are forged when we spend time with people. Take a moment over Christmas with the people that you love, and whether that's literally round an actual table, whether you're going to Skype in and speak to family members all over the world, take a moment to understand how precious that moment is. To reflect on the goodness of what God has given us. When we open our cupboards and we make food, why don't we take a moment to realize that God has given those kind of all of that ingredients in the cupboard for us to use so that we will eat probably far too much over Christmas? Why don't we say thank God? Why do we say thank God for January when we can go running again? You know, when we go and all join a gym or whatever the New Year's resolution that is going to be. Why do we make friendships? Why do we make our families better? Why do we create a better environment? Did you know you are able to create an environment? You'll be going into some family parties and Uncle George always never has a good word to say about anybody. We've always, everyone's got family and has got an Uncle George. But actually, why don't you change the culture? Why didn't you bring a smile? Why didn't you bring a joke? Why didn't you bring a game? Why didn't you bring yourself as a gift to the party to say, I'm going to boost this culture? Why don't you be the gift? Why don't you be the difference? 
because God in you says, that's what I want you to be in life over Christmas. We can create these moments because God loves making things. And I wanted to bring this. I've got a card here because I wanted to tell you in simple that God created the very first Christmas. The reason we celebrate Christmas because it is a story that we call the Nativity. I don't know if you know, but the nativity actually only popped up as a phrase uh, a thousand years after Jesus' birth. It was by this great monk that we talk about and we quote in history called St. Francis of Assisi. You know, he would read the Bible. All of our Christmas narratives are from two chapters and we kind of read it all over December. It's just really two, two chapters, you know, in Matthew and in Luke. And they tell you about this wonderful story that we know. And actually, so Francis of Assisi, uh, what he did was he actually put all of the characters to go and create an nativity plate. You know, if you've got a nativity card, a Christmas card, it, all of it goes on to one picture. And it, and it starts with an angel who has this sent to earth from heaven. Sarah, thank you for doing my lovely card, by the way. So I really appreciate you doing that. I said, can you do it a little bit big so people can see? And um, Emma, if you want to zoom in on the camera to get anybody at home so they can see the fine detail on the artwork, that would be really good. And she is sent to Mary. I don't know about you, but have you really imagined what that experience was like? If you were a teenage girl uh, and suddenly you have an, uh, an appearance of an angel who says, I want you to carry the Son of God, that must have been quite daunting. You're going to bear a child. Mary, the world's in a mess, and I've got a plan to clean it up. But I want to give birth to my son, Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. And then Joseph, you know, <laughs> I'd love to be on that conversation where Mary says, I'm pregnant. You know, let's be really honest, because you'd have had your doubts, wouldn't you? Let's be honest. How many of you have said, an angel's appeared to me, Joseph. You know, I'm going to be pregnant with the son of God. Most of us have gone, uh, yeah, okay. The great thing about the story is Joseph is a good man. He has his own revelation of God. It's incredible, by the way. Whenever God directs us on new journeys in our life, he always speaks to us in advance. And then we see, oh, let me find my characters. I don't want to lose any of the story. Who comes next? The octopus. (laughs) That is good, isn't it? I like that. There is no octopus in... The, the story of Jesus. So this is not love actually. Films, things like that. I love the kind of random cards. There's no panda, by the way, either in that. The shepherds. There's only one shepherd, by the way, just for spatial reasons, because it is a COVID kind of stable. So we just want to keep his maximum, uh, things like that. <clears throat> and then there's a nice little sheep that we'll put on there. Did you Just to kind of uh, be a real kind of party pooper, did you know there's no animals mentioned in the nativity story? Kind of, did you know? So we, we kind of just kind of pencil them in. So little donkey is a heresy. Sorry, sorry, kids. I'm, I'm joking. I, I always say I need to be nicer over Christmas. They so tell me actually, it's that what we do is we use our imagination and we bring the story of the donkey into there. So uh, there we go. There's one king. These are lovely, isn't it? I like to do this a bit slower because it takes things. So you get to do that. There's the second king. Here's one I created earlier. <laughs> it's like a heart attack, isn't it? It's great, isn't it? And there is another king as well. So I'm going to put an animal in, by the way. So obviously that's not in the Bible. The camel in the Bible. We just, when we look at the camel, we just kind of work out. We think the king or the, the wise men came from a fair distance. Uh, and so we just think in the mode of transportation, they didn't have um, vehicle cars in those days. So we're just guessing that a camel was in there. And there we go. We'll put the donkey, we'll put the heresy on, just so you know. So there is, there is an equivalent level of presence in nativity as a donkey, as is a lobster, just to kind of help you uh, with that as well. Don't worry, I have got the baby Jesus coming in a moment, but I'm just going to build up for the big finale and when we'll get to that. Oh, but by the way, um, just to kind of, the kings in the story actually probably 
didn't arrive in the stable. So if you read the Bible narratives, they kind of came two years later into the story. Um, and also, we always have to put it in the stable. It's likely it was a cave. You know, we actually, when we look at the Bible, Jesus, we kind of guess it's a stable because the baby was laid in a manger, which is an animal feeding trough. And therefore, that's why we had all the kind of animals in there. And this is a lovely picture. Francis of Assisi, by the way, when he designed the first nativity, what he was trying to do, he was trying to help people to understand the story of the incarnation of the birth of Jesus Christ. And what he was trying to do, it's a depiction. I don't know if you know what a depiction is, but it is an image, it is a representation of a story. So what he's doing, he's taking the whole story and he is focusing your and my attention onto one picture. So it's okay that they're not there, we know that and we can pull them apart. But in our imagination, he wants us to look at the image of the nativity. I love Christmas cards with the nativity. For me, that is what Christmas is all about. You take the Christ out of Christmas, you just get mass, which is celebration. That's what mass comes from, it's a celebration. And mass is a celebration of Christ. But I find in our Christmases, it's very easy to do everything, to get all what we used to, and to take the baby Jesus away. And a star guided the kings to it. So let's put it all together. It's easy to see. It's easy to remember. It's easy to recall. It's easy to tell our children this story. So what do you see when you look at the nativity? I want you to stare hard. Different characters reveal different things. You might identify with different characters as well. I, I love it because it kind of it stretches loads of boundaries. There's, there's a, a racial boundaries that stretch. This story is really inclusive. There's a gender inclusivity to this story. There's an age inclusive. There's an educational inclusivity from the shepherds to the wise men. And actually, the reason I think God is very, when God created the Christmas, he popped us all into this saying, actually, I want the whole world to look at this moment in history. And to, to not just kind of have all, everybody gathered around that crib set, but actually if, to bring you in so that you gather around This baby Jesus, because something is going on in this moment as you gather around, as you're looking. And you're having that opportunity to do that. Mary, I've got plans for you. I want you to carry them. You might be drawn into something that God in this next season of your life says, I've got plans for you. In your prayers, you suddenly might realize that this is a year of significance. And this is a moment, and actually you're pregnant with something God is about to do, the awesome responsibility of that. And if God is doing, let the Holy Spirit rest on you now. And you just say, look, be according to your word and be obedient in this 2022. Joseph, do the right thing, Joseph. You need to protect Mary. Protect her reputation. Bring up the baby Jesus This year, 2022, might be that you actually, God just says, do the right thing. Because there are so many voices in our head to actually do this, do that, do that. When suddenly there's a loud call that says, actually, do the right thing. The angels, go sing out. Proclaim the goodness of God. It's time to shine. Why don't we sing out in the next season as a church? The shepherds, come and see, go and tell. Why don't we do that this Christmas? Come and see, go and tell of the wonder. The wise men, they sought Jesus. I often saw that bumper sticker those years ago that wise men sought Jesus. They still do. Why don't true wisdom look for Jesus? Herod, afraid, fearful, sinful, angry, the pantomime villain in the story. And yet if we're really honest, how many of you have that little bit of anger inside of you that you want to go, no, I want to do everything I can. He was afraid that Jesus would take his throne and actually he never came. Have you realized in the story that Herod had the opportunity to come and come and to kneel? But he didn't. Did you know you have a choice to come and look and to walk away? There's always a freedom and a choice in following Jesus. The innkeeper. J. John said this. Each of us is an innkeeper deciding if we have room for Jesus. So I want to ask you the question. Are you part of the in crowd or the stable few? There's a drawing around this Christmas. 
when there's so much business going on, that should we come to the final scene. In any movie you watch, there is a final scene. It's where the protagonist of the film, you don't know what protagonist is, do you? It's the main character. It's where the protagonist overrides the antagonist. The antagonist is the challenge. And so the central thing about it is not the stable. It's not all the characters. The centrality of this story is the baby Jesus. When the culmination of this whole story, this whole narrative, this whole nativity is about this moment, the birth of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But is it the final scene? Or is it just the beginning? Because Jesus Christ came, lived his life, grew up as a man, taught the principles of God and then died. He died on a cross. He didn't come to be born. He came to give his life. He came to give his life for you and for me. Because we in a world of darkness were lost, walked away from God, all of that, that sinful nature that we see in Herod, we carry in our life. Even to this day, we understand the effects of sin, of choices that we've made, words that we've said, things that we've done that become a block to God. And Jesus said, I know this about you. I designed you in a garden to live in relationship with me, but these things, and you walk away, but I am not gonna leave you in the darkness for the people have seen a great light. His name is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. He will save his people from their sins. You're part of the people of God. He came to save you and he died on the cross. But is it the final act? Because three days later, he rose from the grave. He's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death couldn't hold him. He broke the power of sin. He rose out of that. And all those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. There is a freedom as followers of Christ that we can live without sin because Jesus came and he started his life and died across. But is that for the final act? Was it the ascension? When Jesus said, right, I'm gonna give my Holy Spirit to you. I'm gonna go up to heaven and leave with you so that you can work this out with me and you in coronation. Is that the final act? Because there's gonna be a day that we're united with Christ again in eternity in the context of a family with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I hope that we get the goodness of this message that the salvation is not just about us, but it's about your family too. It's about your friends. And this little story of Jesus is what changes the world. So can I invite you just to take a moment on this homemade Christmas card and just to have a little look. This Christmas, in all the busyness, and find Jesus. Maybe you can close your eyes right now. Maybe you can think of all the things that you want for Christmas. Maybe you can think about whether you deserve them or not. Maybe you can think that actually it doesn't matter what you deserve. You're loved by God. So much so that God so loved the world. God loved you that he sent his only son to die for you. you Take a few moments just to confess some of the sins that you've struggled with in 2021. Say, God, would you forgive me? This Christmas, I'm going to invite you into my life. Jesus, the light of the world, shine in my Christmas. That every evening I put the lights on, every light resembles your goodness and your grace. moment while you just before God maybe invite God to use you as a light to to somebody else someone to call someone to send a Christmas card to someone to forgive someone to bake some cookies for something for you to create that carries the goodness of God that somehow points to the greatest story ever told